Good afternoon. Um, my name is Jeremy Glover, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to our latest Fenwick Elliott webinar. Last week's webinar attracted a global audience, including attendees from New Zealand, West Africa, and the Middle East. So it's timely that this week we're looking at some of the differences between payment provisions under the English common law and the Middle East civil codes. I'm pleased to be joined by two of our partners from our Dubai office, Ahmed Ibrahim, who co-founded the office in 2015, and is the current managing partner where he works alongside Patrick Stone, who has considerable experience of working both in London and Dubai. This means that together they are perfectly placed to advise on projects in the Middle East, whether the project is subject to English common law or one of the local civil codes. So Patrick, Ahmed, I leave the stage to you. I believe Ahmed, you're starting with pay when paid clauses. Yes, thank you very much, Jeremy. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we will discuss today the back-to-back um, -back payment provisions that are commonly used in the Middle East. Um, these provisions are usually imposed by main contractors in subcontract agreements with the aim to obviously pass on the risk of non-payment to the subcontractors down in the contractual chain. And this gives a tool to uh, control cash flow from main contractors perspective this topic is, uh, besides being very important from a practical and legal point of view, it's, it's one of the areas where the approaches and positions of common law and civil law systems are uh, very different. Uh, you, can, you can see on uh, uh, the slide uh, uh, the two forms or the common forms uh, of uh, payment, uh, pay when paid uh, clauses. The first one provides for a time frame to make the payment, and this time frame starts to, uh, to run from the receipt of payment from uh, the employer. Uh, sometimes this form comes also with uh, a provision that is uh, uh, to, the, to, to the effect, if no payment was made by the employer within a certain amount of time, then the main contractor will have to pay the subcontractor within a reasonable time. Uh, this will obviously be uh, a less problematic uh, uh, provision, uh, practically speaking, uh, uh, because the subcontractor will have uh, a ground to claim its entitlements uh, at the end of the day. The second form is where the payment is a conditional obligation. This is uh, a more uh, rigid approach uh, uh, because it makes clear that the subcontractor accepts the risk of uh, non-payment by the employer. Uh, I intend to speak about the position of uh, these clauses uh, uh, under the EUE law, but before I, I do that, Patrick will cover these questions and provisions and how they are dealt with from an English law uh, uh, perspective. Uh, Patrick? Thanks, Ahmed. Um, under English law, um, pay when paid provisions um, are dealt with as part of the Housing Grants Construction Regeneration Act 1996. Uh, now, they introduced um, wide ranging changes to how construction contracts, and in particular uh, the payment provisions uh, to contracts and subcontractors, are governed by English law. Um, payment provisions are, are dealt with under sections 109 to 113 of the Construction Act. Um, with pay when paid provisions dealt with under section 113. Um, and the provision that the position is pretty straightforward. Um, section 113 of the Act, as you can see on the on the screen there, uh, states that provision making payment under a construction contract conditional on the payer receiving payment from a third person is ineffective unless that third person is insolvent. Um, in other words, if your uh, contract for, for construction works being performed in England um, in, or in Britain includes a pay and pay provision, um, it will not have any effect uh, unless the reason for that non-payment is insolvency of the, the next party up the line. Um, this provision doesn't wipe out the payment provisions in the contract entirely. Uh, it's just the pay and paid elements of those provisions. Uh, indeed, subsection 6 of section 113 makes it clear that, that where a pay when paid provision is deemed ineffective by the, by the section, uh, any other payment terms that have been agreed between the parties uh, will continue to apply. Um, however, if there is no clear payment mechanism in the contract, and by this I mean that there is no provision setting out how payment is to be claimed or the date by which payment is to be made, 
Um, then there are payment provisions set out in, in what is known as the scheme, which is a set of provisions included in the schedule to the, to the Construction Act, um, which will be incorporated into the subcontract and will determine how and when payment is made. Um, I think it's worth just pausing here to consider why these provisions were introduced by the Act, um, particularly when they are not common in other jurisdictions, as Ahmed has, has alluded to and we'll come on to talk about in a minute. Uh, on a first blush, these provisions may seem unreasonable to the contractor. Uh, yeah, they're in a situation where the employer has stopped paying the contractor, so why should the contractor have to pay the subby and effectively be left out of pocket in that contractual change, in that contractual chain rather? Um, the, the short answer is because the contractor is in control of that relationship with the employer to the extent that the subcontractor is not. The contractor has the ability to exercise its rights under the main contract to enforce payment from the employer. If the contractor chooses not to exercise those rights, and it's not hard to see why that contractor may not want to do so, where it has a long-standing commercial relationship and understanding with the employer, uh, then why should the subcontractor have to wait until the main contractor chooses to exercise those rights? Under Article 113, the subcontractor has the ability to force the, the contractor's hand. Um, another of the situations that the Act seeks to avoid is where disputes have arisen up the line, the situation where a, a particular subcontractor has completed its scope of work, has performed its works under its subcontract, um, has submitted its payment applications and received a certificate confirming the sum it's entitled to, but a dispute is developed between the main contractor and the employer, a dispute has nothing to do with the subcontractor, but has caused the employer to suspend payment generally to the main contractor. That dispute could take months to resolve, many months to resolve. So why in those circumstances should a subcontractor who's completed its works have to wait, and in some cases potentially risk insolvency, because of a dispute between the main contractor and the employer that has nothing to do with him. Again, section 113 stops that situation arising. Um, what, one final point before I hand back to Ahmed. Um, the, the provisions of the Construction Act apply specifically to construction contracts for works being carried out in England, Wales and Scotland. Uh, so this means two things. Uh, first, if you have a subcontract for works being performed in England, and for some reason you've negotiated that the subcontract will be governed by the laws of another jurisdiction, uh, section 113 will still take effect so that any pay when paid provisions in that subcontract will be deemed ineffective. The second part of that is that if you have a, a project in another part of the world and you've agreed to have the contract governed by English law, these provisions will not apply. So if you've got a Middle East based project uh, which has an English law provision and you have a pay when paid provision, section 113 will not provide the subcontractor any protection. Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll hand back to, uh, to Ahmed, who will discuss how the, the provisions are dealt with in, in civil law jurisdictions. Thank you, Patrick. Um, in, in, in civil law, I'm speaking from UAE law perspective. The general rule under the, uh, the civil code is, unsurprisingly, that any contractual agreement is valid and enforceable, unless there is a reason uh, to uh, invalidate it. Uh, the grounds for invalidation of any contractual provision uh, uh, might vary, uh, and it depends on the circumstances and factual aspects. Uh, it can, for example, be uh, because of a defective assent uh, uh, or the uh, because of the agreed provision is against uh, public policy or uh, local morals. Uh, the civil code provides for certain mandatory provisions that the parties cannot contract out. Uh, other than these boundaries within the civil codes, a contract is a contract. So the, the, the concept of uh, unfair contract terms uh, uh, do not exist per se under the civil code. Uh, uh, subcontractors are in principle in, uh, entitled to receive payment for any work done on, uh, and this is provided for under the, the civil code, the UE civil code, article 885. Uh, 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 however, um, uh, the parties of course to a contract are free to make any obligation conditional on the occurrence of certain events in the future. Uh, this is expressly permissible uh, uh, under the code, uh, uh, and uh, you can see on, on, on the slide that uh, uh, the uh, uh, Article 420 of the code defines a condition to be a future matter. There is no uh, uh, restriction whatsoever. So uh, uh, 
any future matter can be agreed to be a condition. Um, and Article 429 links the uh, effectiveness of the obligation to the occurrence of certain future uh, uh, events. So applying these general provisions on pay when paid clauses, uh, uh, the uh, the two provisions uh, uh, are can be referred to or relied upon to uh, to support the effectiveness and uh, enforceability of uh, when payment uh, when uh, pay when paid uh, provisions. And these two provisions specifically are referred to by high courts in the UE and several judgments uh, upholding back-to-back uh, -back payment provisions. Uh, uh, the broad definitions and flexible provisions of conditional obligations suggests that uh, no exception to payment obligations, and obviously, uh, unlike the position in, 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 in English law, as, as Patrick uh, pointed out, there is no such an exception to construction contracts. Uh, the the uh, the approach of local courts is is, is uh, somehow straightforward in terms of upholding such payment provisions, and dismiss claims filed by subcontractors on the basis of a premature filing uh, of these claims in case the employer the, the the main contractor proves that they did not receive the payment from the employer. Uh, in some cases, there might be detailed factual questions with respect to the interpretation of the payment clause in question, like the language is not clear or uh, 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 the, 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 the intention of the parties to make the payment conditional is not uh, a clear-cut intention. So, but, 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 but be, um, be aware that applying the UEE principles on contract interpretation uh, might lead to uh, a room to argue that doubt would be interpreted in favor of the debtor, which means in this case, the, the main contractor uh, can get benefit of such uh, interpretation uh, principle. Uh, another area of uh, factual questions would be reviewing the payment uh, statements made by the employer um, and whether any of uh, these payments uh, uh, should count for the works that were carried out by the subcontractor or not. Uh, for example, there might be a case where the employer has made payment for the um, for the works of the subcontractor, but applied deductions with respect to other works done by others, uh, or applied uh, any contractual set-off right uh, that has no relationship whatsoever to the claim made by the subcontractor or the entitlement of the subcontractor in question. Uh, so, the, 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 in these cases, the subcontractor can uh, uh, can argue that there is no uh, application of the pay when paid uh, clauses on factual basis, uh, and, and the principle is that the subcontractor can only claim proportional payment from what received from the employer corresponding to the works done by the, that subcontractor. Uh, that's how it works. Uh, this, this, of course, affects payment practices in the Middle East and increases uh, the risk of um, uh, subcontractors, uh, bearing in mind that subcontractors might not be in, in a very strong position uh, in terms of negotiating the contract provisions at the time of the contract. So it's, it's, it's advisable for, for, for subcontractors to try uh, uh, to, uh, to negotiate the back-to-back -back payment provisions and at least to agree an obligation on the contractor to pursue claims against employer uh, in a timely manner, diligently, if needed to. Um, and also, uh, uh, it, it may be helpful if, if the subcontractor agrees with the contractor to have uh, a reporting mechanism by which the main contractor should keep the subcontractor up to date with any uh, uh, legal pro legal proceedings taken against the employer seeking the payment of the entitlement of uh, uh, the main contractor, including the works done by the subcontractor. Uh, but in the in the absence of these provisions, there might be still room to argue that the main contractor is, is supposed to act. Uh, uh, to perform the contract in, in a good faith manner. That's that's a legal duty under the civil code. Uh, so the good faith 
suggests that the contractor should pursue a claim against the employer in certain circumstances. Uh, one can take the view that uh, uh, this is an implied term uh, under Article 246, subparagraph 2 of uh, in, in, in the Civil Code. Uh, so that's the uh, the actions or uh, advices that uh, the uh, uh, subcontractors can take, bearing in mind that the short answer to the enforceability of pay when paid clauses is that they are valid and enforceable under the UEE code. Um, we will now turn to speak about the, um, the remedy, remedies available for non-payment. Uh, Patrick will first cover uh, English law. Patrick? Thanks, Ahmed. Um, so the, the, the Construction Act in, in, uh, in the UK, uh, in addition to providing protection to subcontractors by making pay when paid provisions ineffective, uh, also provides two express remedies to the supply chain to enforce their payment rights. Um, the, the first of those, uh, as most of you listening will know, is, is a statutory adjudication provision, which allows parties to a construction contract to, to seek a quick independent determination of disputes during the progress of the works. Um, although the procedure, uh, the adjudication procedure has been somewhat hijacked over the years by parties referring more complex disputes to adjudication, uh, one of its primary purposes was to, to facilitate cash flow in projects to ensure that those down the supply chain have a quick and robust mechanism to, to enforce payment of sums that they're entitled to under the contract. Um, the, the process is implied in construction contracts in England, Wales and Scotland, uh, and it's compulsory and the decision of the adjudicator is, is binding on the parties uh, and significantly uh, can be enforced in, uh, by the courts in the interim uh, until a dispute is, is ultimately determined by the courts or through arbitration. Uh, in, in short, it provides a swift remedy for contractors, subcontractors, and, and further down the supply chain for, for non-payment from those immediately above them in the supply chain. Um, the second remedy for non-payment in the Construction Act is, is the right to suspend the works. Uh, Section 112 of the Construction Act specifically uh, entitles a party under a construction contract, uh, which is due a sum under that contract, to suspend performance and, until the payment is made. Uh, suspension can be made on just seven days notice and uh, if the delay occurs to the work so the party has not been paid because of that suspension uh, that party will be entitled to an extension of time. Um, now in relation to the, to the first of those mechanisms I've just spoken about, adjudication, uh, many construction contracts used outside of the UK uh, including in civil law jurisdiction, jurisdictions will have similar provisions to uh, the adjudication provisions in the Construction Act uh, in England, indeed, that the most common form of contract used in the Middle East, the FIDIC forms of contract, contract um, have a dispute adjudication board um, provision um, that was introduced in the 99 version of the, of the FIDIC contract and, it, and is retained in a slightly modified form uh, in the latest versions. Um, but the key differences between those provisions and the provisions under English law is that while the decisions of the boards are also deemed to be binding on the parties, they do not become final and binding if one of the parties disputes the determination. Um, plus the DAB provisions are not supported by enforcement provisions in local law that would allow the decision to be enforced in the short term while the works continue and while the dispute is referred to arbitration. So while a contractor or other parties in the supply chain may have a mechanism for getting a decision that says they're entitled to money, that mechanism does not provide a, a remedy, either quick or otherwise, in the same way that the adjudication provisions in the Construction Act uh, provide a, a quick remedy for, for, for contractors or subcontractors on construction projects in England and Wales and Scotland. Um, so contractors in, in civil law jurisdictions therefore have to seek um, kind of alternative self-help remedies uh, to enforce payment, which, uh, which Ahmed is going to, to turn to now. Right, thanks, Patrick. Um, suspension. Suspension is, is, is a very strong and effective tool in, in case of non-payment. But we, we, we always advise our clients to be uh, careful in exercising the right of suspension because the consequences of, of suspending construction projects uh, uh, might be very serious. Uh, so before exercising a right of suspension, uh, uh, contractor or subcontractor have to uh, make sure that they uh, do it properly in compliance with the contract and uh, uh, relevant provisions from the civil code. Uh, first, the party exercising the suspension right should be clear as to whether this 
suspension is under the contract or uh, uh, under uh, Article uh, 247 of the Civil Code. Uh, uh, some contracts provide uh, for uh, suspension rights, some others not. Uh, uh, in case uh, there is no suspension provisions in the contract, then uh, uh, a party seeking the suspension might rely on, on, on the legal provision in the code, and they must comply with the notification also uh, uh, provisions, if any, or uh, if there is no notification uh, provision they have to, out of good faith, performing a contract in good faith, notify uh, the other party of their intention to suspend the work within a reasonable uh, uh, time frame. Uh, usually, pay when paid clauses are not linked uh, uh, in any manner to suspension right. So, which means, even if the employer is in a position uh, to justify uh, their failure to pay, not to pay, uh, uh, by way of saying, uh, sorry, we have not received payment from the employer. Th this justification uh, uh, is acceptable from a payment point of view, but this should not affect the subcontractor's right to suspend the work in the circumstances. Uh, that's the uh, first uh, self-remedy uh, action that can be taken by um, subcontractor. Termination also is is a remedy, but you have to be very careful uh, uh, because non-payment in the case of pay when paid clause is not a ground for termination in itself is not a ground so, because the, the, the contractor is simply is is not in breach of any any contractual uh, 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 obligation. So uh, uh, subcontractors might try to find uh, any other grounds for the termination of the contract. Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, in, 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 in a case uh, in, in Abu Dhabi High Court, Supreme Court, uh, the, the employer suffered from financial difficulties and suspended the works for uh, two years. Uh, the subcontractor sought the, the, the payment from the main contractor. The main contractor argued the premature filing of the claim on the basis that the main contractor has, has not received payment from the employer. And then the, uh, the subcontractor saw the termination of the contract on the ground of the impossibility to perform uh, the contractual uh, obligations by the parties, given the uh, uh, financial status of the employer. The court accepted uh, the ground for termination and accepted the, uh, uh, to compel the main contractor to pay the entitlements of the subcontractor. Uh, because pay when paid clauses do not survive termination. So um, uh, that's why the court accepted the payment. But the court rejected uh, uh, the compensation sought by the subcontractor uh, uh, on the basis that the main contractor did not do anything wrong. Uh, they simply did not pay because of the uh, non-payment by the employer. Uh, also, one of the measures to be taken or uh, the remedies is the interim measure. Um, interim measure is such uh, uh, ex parte uh, proceedings to be taken uh, uh, before a summary judge um, uh, to to seek the uh, attachment order over the assets. Maybe from uh, if filed by the subcontractor, you can you can place an attachment order over the assets of the main contractor or. Uh, to apply pressure on the employer, so the, to, to encourage the employer somehow to make the payment of the, the main contractor, you can you can apply to to place an attachment order over the main contractor's entitlements uh, with uh, the uh, the employer. This this cause of action is available under the Civil Procedural uh, Civil Procedures Act uh, in in the UAE. Uh, Action uh, uh, Polian, that's, that's the uh, uh, civil law system uh, theory uh, the, and, and cause of action that allows one of the parties, a third party to any transaction or any deal done by two other parties to, um, to seek the invalidation of, uh, of such a deal in case uh, uh, this 
this deal uh, comes with unfair provisions uh, that causes harm to uh, the third party. So the uh, in, in 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 some cases where, for instance, if the uh, if the employer and the main contractor decided to conclude a deal uh, and to uh, to have a commercial arrangement to uh, give, for example, other projects. Uh, uh, from the employer to the main contractor uh, uh, against a waiver of payment uh, of uh, the project in question, then the subcontractor can take an action against uh, uh, both parties to invalidate, to seek the invalidation of uh, uh, this deal. Uh, these are the uh, main uh, actions uh, that can be taken and remedies that can be taken. And now we move to uh, discuss practical tips. Um, uh, these tips can be um, considered at uh, the drafting stage of the contract, which uh, uh, Patrick will comment on. Patrick? Uh, yeah, I mean, I just want to look at some of the, the, the kind of practical tips that you want to think about when you're inter entering into to contracts and considering including uh, pay when pay clauses or, or something similar. Uh, and I'm going to include, uh, consider these both from a, a common law and a civil law perspective. Um, now, I mean, although as we've, we've seen, common law, at least English law and, and civil law, might take quite different approaches to the enforcement of pay when pay clauses. Uh, my own view is that, that, that main contractors should, should, in any event, think quite carefully about whether or not to include these clauses and what form those clauses should, clauses should take, uh, even if you are uh, in a civil law jurisdiction. I mean, obviously, from an English law perspective, uh, the inclusion of pay when pay clause makes little sense if it's simply going to be deemed to be ineffective. Um, but some international contracts, for example, the FIDIC contracts include pay and pay provisions. Um, so if you're using a, a FIDIC contract in, in England, um, which although uncommon is not completely unheard of, um, you will need to think about making adjustments to your subcontract to reflect the position of law. Um, but, but even in civil law jurisdiction, uh, I question whether the imposition of a, of a strict pay when pay clause is in everyone's best interest. Um, and when I say strict, what I mean is a clause that gives the contractor a, an unfettered or unlimited right to, to withhold payment. And the inclusion of a clause can, can have the effect of creating distrust between contractors and the supply chain from the outside of the project. And it very much gives the impression of the contractor protecting its own position first and then worrying about its subcontractors and supply chain later. Um, what, one mechanism we, we sometimes see, particularly in relation to nominated subcontractors, uh, is direct payment clauses in the main contract that allows employers to, to pay nominated subcontractors directly. Um, however, these are generally limited to circumstances where the employer has made payment to the main contractor in respect of works performed by the subcontractor, and the contractor has not passed these sums on to the subcontractor. Uh, and therefore, therefore, they generally do not assist subcontractors in a situation where the employer has not paid the, the main contractor, which is what we're considering here. Um, so, in terms of potential solutions, um, I mean, I think that it's important to uh, ensure that the terms of the subcontract are back to back with the main contract. Um, by this, I mean that the terms of the subcontract reflect those in the main contract and the subcontractor is aware of, and not just deemed to be aware of, but is actually aware of the terms of the main contract. And if there are certain steps the main contractor has to go through to be entitled to payment under the main contract, um, the subcontractor should have to go through the same steps. This avoids a situation where the grounds on which an employer can withhold payment might be different from the grounds on which the, the main contractor can withhold payment. Um, second, and this might be viewed as a slight exception to what I've just said about clauses being back to back, um, but, but it, it's also worth considering uh, staggered application dates so that um, where payment applications from subcontractors are provided, um, that they may be provided kind of say seven days before application is to be submitted um, by, by the main contractor under the main contract. Um, the, the, uh, and the payment terms should be adjusted to reflect this. Um, this should ensure that, that subcontractors' payments, payment applications are included promptly in the contractor's applications, meaning that the, the payment process should, should work in their favour. Um, third, you might want to consider certain carve outs in any payment pay provisions that limit the circumstances in which the provisions will apply. Um, for example, the pay and pay provisions in the FIDIC subcontract um, doesn't apply in the, uh, in the event of the contractor default under the main contract. Um, so that, that creates a situation that the, the, the contractor can't take advantage of the situation um, and just refuse to pay the subcontractor where the contractor is itself in breach under the main contract. 
And that, that really kind of reflects the position of law, even in civil jurisdictions that Ahmed has reflected already, that says that the contractor can't seem to use, seek to use those provisions to, to, to cover its own breaches um, and to uh, you know, avoid payment to the subcontractor when the subcontractor is entitled to payment, but payment hasn't come down the line because of breaches um, by the main contractor. Um, so those are the three things I think, you know, kind of think about at the point you're drafting the contract. Um, Ahmed will now kind of come on to uh, avoiding payment disputes um, where, where those clauses are included in the contract. Right. Um, in, in, in short, uh, it's, it's very important that measures to be taken uh, immediately in, in, in a timely manner. Uh, meaning that if there is a payment application made by the subcontractor and the main contractor th thinks that the payment is late by uh, uh, the employer, there must be uh, some sort of coordination and transparency between the parties and the contractor should keep subcontractors in to, in, 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 uh, up to date with any such negotiations or uh, uh, discussions with the employer. Uh, if there are any uh, legal actions to be taken, should be taken uh, um, uh, reasonably in a timely manner uh, uh, and, and in coordination with uh, subcontractors. Uh, and that's, that's, that's in general the, um, what is expected from the parties uh, acting in a manner that is consistent with the good faith requirement under the contract, under the civil code. Uh, uh, there might be cases uh, where uh, 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 it would be advisable that contractors should consult uh, subcontractors in discussing any uh, payment uh, uh, terms to be agreed with the employer in terms of uh, 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 applying discounts or deductions or whatsoever. Uh, so contractors should make sure that uh, they keep subcontractors in, 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 uh, in the picture of any such discussions with uh, the main contractor. These are the, uh, I think, the, for, from an employer, from employer's perspective, I think they, they, they have uh, uh, to make sure to, to find, uh, even if they struggle from any financial uh, difficulties or cash flow issues, they have, they have to find, try to find sensible uh, uh, payment terms and negotiate with uh, main contractors and ensure that uh, subcontractors at least getting paid of uh, 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 cash flow needed uh, to, to continue uh, the work uh, uh, or, or in the site. Uh, these are the, the practical tips for avoiding disputes, I think. Um, and um, at the end, I, 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 I leave it to Jeremy. Uh, I'm not sure if we have received any questions. No. Uh, well, we have received some questions, um, Patrick Ahmed. Um, thank you for your um, very thorough presentation. And in fact, so thorough that you've actually managed to quietly answer a couple of the questions, um, for example, about suspension clauses as the presentation went on. So that's always good. Um, you touched briefly on insolvency from time to time. Um, if the um, employer is insolvent, in the case of insolvency against the employer, um, can the subcontractor join in the liquidation process and register its debt on the basis of a pay when paid clause? Um, or Patrick. Uh, so I was going to say the, the um, I mean, the short answer to that is, is no, um, because there's still privity of contract between the, the, the employer and the contractor, and the subcontractor has no direct contractual relationship with the uh, with the employer. Um, so the, the the money that is owed, any money that is owed from the employer, is owed to the contractor um, in the in the employer contractor relationship, and then the subcontractor has a claim against the the contractor for any of that any part of that that, that belongs to him. Um, I mean, I would say that the if, if a subcontractor finds himself in that situation and they, they want to make sure that the, the communication with the contractor is kept open and the contractor lets the subcontractor know what is happening with the liquidation uh, and to make sure that the contractor is pursuing those claims on behalf of the subcontractor and equally the subcontractor should be pursuing those claims on behalf of the subcontractor against the employer. Um, and, and if they get to the end and the contractor hasn't, um, you know, uh, Done what it can to, to to get payment from the from the liquidators. Um, then the subcontractor may well have have some kind of rights of, of recovery against the contractor in any event. Ahmed, was there anything you wanted to add? 
Uh, no, I agree that it's, uh, it's uh, yeah, that's 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 the position under the civil code, and 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 I I, I assume that Patrick has answered this question from the UAE law perspective, which is which I agree okay, with. Okay, perfect, perfect. Um, and the, I've had another a related question. I think I think which again I think has been answered by 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 the answer. It, the question, the first question specifically related to insolvency, also had a question that whether a subcontractor has a right to go against an employer. And I think Patrick's already dealt with that by the, the privity of, of contract point. And the answer is no, still looking to the contractor, whether it's an insolvency or non-insolvency position. Um, twisting the question slightly, if a main contractor is not paying a subcontractor, can the employer pay the subcontractor direct? So obviously the employer might be concerned that the subcontractor is not really uh, performing or might be considering suspension because it's not being paid, but monies have actually gone to the main contractor. Is there anything the employer can do in that situation? Usually contracts, uh, uh, unless Patrick wants to say something. <laughs> I, I was just going to say that there would need to be some kind of contractual entitlement to that. And uh, you know, as I've mentioned, there is a, you do sometimes see direct payment provisions, um, you know, in a main contract that allows an employer to make payment to subcontractors in, in, in the circumstances where the, the main contractor isn't, isn't paying, but there would need to be a, there would need to be that right under the contract. I think that's, I think that's correct under both common law and under civil law. Yes, I agree with that, and there might be clear right under the contract. In the absence of such right, uh, the, the, uh, it is advisable for employers to seek the consent of uh, the main contractor to make direct payment to subcontractors. Uh, and in such case, I, uh, I would advise uh, uh, the parties to, uh, to think about and discuss the details as to the uh, liabilities, uh, because this may raise uh, potential liabilities uh, uh, in the future. Yeah, I mean th that that seems seems sensible. Um, if relations between the contractor and the um, employer have got to the stage where the contractor has actually filed arbitration proceedings against the employer, um, is there anything the subcontractor can do? Can the subcontractor join in those proceedings? This will very much depend on the arbitration clause itself and the main contract and the subcontract agreements. Um, some contracts actually provide for back-to-back -back arbitration clauses and some contracts provide not only an entitlement to the subcontractor to join the proceedings but an obligation on the subcontractor to support the main contractor in certain circumstances where the dispute uh, relates to the uh, uh, works carried out by the uh, uh, subcontractor, uh, and some provisions can be uh, can include that the main contractor and subcontractor uh, will jointly instruct counsel who uh, act for both of them uh, uh, for, uh, in the proceedings against the employer. But in the absence of any, also this depends on the uh, uh, set of rules, the institutional arbitration rules. Uh, uh, the, or, uh, the arbitration would be conducted accordingly because, you know, some arbitration rules provide uh, for uh, joinder uh, proceedings. So, but in the absence of any such contractual provisions or assumingly the arbitral institution rules do not provide for, do not support the uh, uh, joinder, then uh, the subcontractor might at least um, ask the contractor to keep them up to date and provide them with a copy of the documents in the proceedings in and and contractors will be i think uh, obliged to to do that in, in compliance or in line with uh, acting in good faith okay thank you um thank you very much and i think um we will leave it there um this afternoon so thank you both patrick Ahmed, for your informative presentation thank you um for for, for watching and for the questions that you've submitted. Um, next week, we will be having an, an update webinar. About three or four weeks ago, John Miller and Dave, Dave Bebb uh, gave, gave a discussion about the impact of COVID-19 on construction contracts and the imp impact on performance on sites and provided some, some tips as to what contractors, employers, subcontractors should be doing.
and we thought it was time four weeks on to update that. So next week, please join myself, John and Dave as we look at the continuing impact of COVID-19 on construction contracts and, site, and, on, and on sites. But thank you very much for attending today and goodbye. Bye. Thank you. Thanks.